Welcome to episode three of Islands in the League presented by DraftKings, our exclusive YouTube video series. In episode three, I will be giving you my take on a specific comic book superhero within the context of the NBA. Plus, we visit the question, what happens when a 15-year NBA vet on a two-year hiatus who hasn't touched a basketball or worked out during that time period decides randomly that he wants to make a comeback a month before the playoffs start. And lastly, we'll be joined by our resident betting expert, Josh Applebaum from Vizen to discuss some recent NBA betting trends. So snuggle up with a loved one and let's get right into episode three. It's because in NBA discourse, we always talk about what is going on upstairs. This is a this is a transition. I'm going to use this as a transition. I want you to ask yourself a question. What defines a superstar in the NBA? Oftentimes, legacies are built upon all-star appearances, all-NBA nods, MVPs. But more often, real superstar legacies are built on playoff success, specifically Championships and rings. Yes, hashtag ring culture. Now I want you to think about your favorite superstar. Maybe it's Kobe. Maybe it's Dirk. Maybe it's Shaq. Maybe it's Jordan. Maybe it's LeBron. Maybe it's Kawhi. What do all those guys have in common? Sure, they've made all-star games. They've made all-NBA. Some of them have even won multiple MVPs. But they all have won a championship or multiple championships. Before we dive in, I want to take you back to 2005. That year, a movie was released, a, a little indie film by an up-and-coming director. That director was Christopher Nolan, and that movie was Batman Begins. There's a very important scene towards the end of the film. Batman is stuck in a burning mansion with a giant beam on his chest. He can't move. He's about to die. And who walks in to save him? Alfred. Alfred saves Batman. Why do we fall, sir? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. Now, why am I bringing up a random movie scene from only the second best Christopher Nolan Batman movie? It's because in NBA discourse, we always talk about Batmans and Robins. Every superstar is Batman. And of course, every Batman needs a Robin. He needs a sidekick he can rely on. But occasionally, he needs an Alfred. Recent NBA history is littered with examples of superstars in clutch, intense moments, needing an Alfred, needing a role player to step into the moment and save them. Let's go back to 2011. Dirk Nowitzki, longtime Dallas Mavericks, greatest player in franchise history, led them to a championship. And Dirk absolutely deserves all the credit and all the praise he's gotten for that championship. It was a culmination of an outstanding career, a Hall of Fame career. And Dirk was awesome in the finals. Over 26 points a game, averaged almost 10 rebounds, and hit so many clutch buckets. But here's the thing. Dallas shot 41.1% from three in that series. Deshaun Stevenson shot 13 for 23 from three. A 37-year-old Jason Kidd knocked down 12 of 28 triples. And Jason Terry, the Robin, averaged 19 a game and shot 39% from three. Just to get to the finals, the role players from the Mavs had to step up big. J.J. Barea, in both the Western Conference semifinals and the Western Conference finals, averaged over 11.5 points a game in about 17 minutes a game. He was dominant in a number of games against the L.A. Lakers in the Western Conference semifinals. Peja Stojakovic, in that series, hit 11 three-pointers. And so with all those great Mavs teams that Dirk played on, ultimately what it came down to was not only his greatness, but the greatness of the Alfred. One of my personal favorite Alfreds is Shane Battier. Game 7, 2013 NBA Finals. Hadn't played a ton in that series. Comes in, hits 6 of 8 threes, and is a plus 12 in a 5-point win. The following year, in a rematch of the 2013 Finals, Patty Mills and Danny Green helped the Spurs get their revenge, combining for 22 threes in that series. Do the Warriors win in 2015 without Andre Iguodala? 
Do the Warriors win in 2022 without the performance of Andrew Wiggins? In Game 7 of the 1994 NBA Finals, Sam Cassell, a rookie, came off the bench and had 13 points in 18 minutes, helping Hakeem Olajuwon to win his first NBA championship. Think about those great Lakers teams with Kobe and Shaq. And then think about the big-time clutch baskets that Robert Ory made, that Derek Fisher made. Heck, I was the victim of one of Derek Fisher's biggest shots. 2009, Game 4, we're at home. It's a 2-1 series deficit. We're getting ready to tie this thing up, and Derek Fisher hits a 3 to send it into overtime, and we lose. The Lakers would go on to beat us, and that would give Kobe Bryant his first NBA championship without Shaq. Your favorite player, Michael Jordan. Game 6 in 1993 against the Phoenix Suns, Paxson hits a series-ending three-pointer to give the Chicago Bulls their first three-peat. And then, in 1997, Game 6 again, Steve Kerr steps up to the foul line, knocks down a jumper on the pass from Jordan. Two series-winning plays from two of the greatest Alfreds ever. The point is not to diminish greatness. The point is to celebrate greatness. So let's celebrate the greatest players as we always do, for their accomplishment, for their winning, for their championships, for their legacies. I can appreciate it as well as anyone. But let's also celebrate the role player. Let's celebrate the Alfred. Let's celebrate the guy that doesn't get the headlines but stepped up in the big moment. Here's a little stat I stumbled across the other day, and I'll touch on this more in Episode 4 of Islands in the League. I looked at the last 30 years of the NBA. Did you know that there's only been eight times that the MVP has also won a championship. And two of those times were Michael Jordan and LeBron James for the second time. So there's been six players in 30 years who have won MVP and won a championship in the same season. Basketball is a team sport. Personally, I think it's the greatest sport. And so while you need Batmans, you need Robins, you also need Alfreds. You need a Lucius Fox. Heck, Sometimes you might even need Catwoman. And so as we get ready for the playoffs, and all of us will be making our picks and predictions, and all of the attention will be on guys like De'Aaron Fox and Kevin Durant and Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid and Giannis Antetokounmpo and Jason Tatum. Let's not forget about some potential Alfreds who I think could run into that burning building and help save Batman. In the West, Kevin Herter and Malik Monk from the Sacramento Kings. Terrence Mann from the Los Angeles Clippers, Bruce Brown from the Denver Nuggets, Josh Kogi and Torrey Craig from the Phoenix Suns. And in the East, DeAnthony Melton from the 76ers, Grayson Allen, love him or hate him from the Milwaukee Bucks, our guy Bobby Portis, and perhaps my personal favorite Alfred, Derek White. Derek White is like Michael Caine's Alfred. I don't want to bury you, Batman. I will not put you in the ground in a little box. I'm not going to bury another Batman. Another Batman? How many Batmans has he been burying? How many are there? I've buried 14 Batmans I've buried so far. 14 Batman. And a little pointy ears I'm in not... a box. And if I didn't mention a potential Alfred from your favorite team, my apologies. But maybe there's a reason for that. So as we head down to the home stretch and we debate about MVP and all NBA and look ahead to potential playoff matchups, we're going to enter the most intense, the most high pressure time in the NBA season. Let's not forget about the role player. Let's not forget about Alfred. You gotta blow the bloody doors off. (laughs) I'm not bearing another Batman. (laughs) (laughs) That was pretty good. I retired in September of 2021. I've been out of the NBA for nearly two full seasons. And I'd be lying to you if there weren't certain days that I thought to myself, could I still play in the NBA? I'd be lying to you if there were certain days that I thought to myself, I can still play in the NBA. I would also say that almost every day, whether it's on social media, in person, at the gym, when I take my kid to coach him, that someone doesn't come up to me and says, you should go play for the Sixers. You should go play for the Lakers. You should go play for the Celtics. What would happen if I actually acted on those intuitions and requests? Let's find out. I tried golf, tried sports betting, tried podcasting, tried fucking with Stephen A. 
I just can't scratch it. I need to compete. I need to win a championship. You know, one last push. One last dance, if you will. Ooh, we should call it that. We should call it one last dance. Call Spencer Hawes. Anytime I call this guy, he's there for me. Every single time. True friend. I'm not going to pick up this motherfucker. Who else could I call? Game time. I don't know, the idea probably first formed sometime in January. You know, Bron had just turned 38. He was playing unbelievable and we're the same age, similar body type, similar play style. And I don't know, man, I feel like if, if he can do it, I can do it, you know? Man, I live in the gym. Not like every day, but like a few times a week, usually. Not on the weekends, and I've been golfing a lot in the summer, but this is my shit, man. If JJ actually called you tomorrow and was like, man, I'm making a comeback, what would you do? Look, when we're talking about hydrating, I don't think wine is the solution, and that's all I've seen JJ drink for a while. Stroke feels good. Shot feels normal. Um, like it's probably made like 75%, 80%. Jeez, he making a comeback for the playoffs. Could have me three years ago. Court seems a lot bigger than when I played. Um, it's a lot of running, man. You also quit on the Mavs, right? Only played eight games. <laughs> I don't know, man, like, as they say, something in the orange tells me we're not done. The court's getting bigger. If anybody's watching this, like I, I just want to win. I want to help you. Um, I turn my notifications on on my phone. Uh, do not disturb is off. Silence off. Like I'm ready for the call. If you see this, like I'm ready. I'm ready to hold it steady. I feel like I still got it. I feel like I still got it. I feel like I still got it. <laughs> For act three of this episode of Islands in the League, let's welcome in Josh Applebaum from Vizen. All right, let's welcome in our betting expert, Josh Applebaum from Vizen. Josh, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, JJ. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, I think we should discuss MVP because I feel like there's been a lot of movement since the last time we checked in. I know Jokic for a large part of this season was the odds on favorite. Where are we right now in the MVP race when we talk about betting odds? Yeah, JJ, a lot has changed since the last time we recorded the last episode. And really what we've seen is a huge adjustment here across the market. Now you're totally right. Jokic has kind of been the leader pretty much all season long. You've seen him roughly around a minus 175, minus 200 favorite. But over the last month or so, Embiid has made a huge move here. And if you actually look back a week ago, we had Embiid all the way up to minus 200 favorite. You had Embiid 
putting in some incredible numbers. The 76ers were on a great win streak. The uh, the Nuggets tailed off a little bit. They still have the best record in the NBA, but you know, for uh, Jokic's numbers, you know, not exactly uh, his greatest line, but still for any average player, still incredible numbers here. So kind of that adjustment, we saw a huge flip where Embiid went to minus 200. But this is how, and this is why I got to get your opinion on this one, JJ, because a lot of betters are really don't know what to do with this one because now we've seen uh, a complete shift in the other way return here. So uh, now the updated numbers, we have Jokic plus 105 at DraftKings. So you're getting some plus money on Jokic, the slight favorite here, plus 115 for Embiid. So both players are just a little bit of plus money. Next guy is Giannis plus 475, and then no one else is better than 10 to 1. So it's really between these two players here. So my question to you, JJ, is you know if, if you were voting or if you're playing on the court here, Who's the most valuable player? Who and what constitutes being the most valuable? Is it always just the best player? Or is it kind of that Mike Trout thing where he's always the best player, but is he the most valuable if you're always in last place if you're the Angels? So who's going to get this award, JJ? And then also this game that we saw on Monday night between these two, uh, we were really excited to watch this thing. Jokic, Embiid going head-to-head. Embiid sits out there with an injury. Jokic plays, puts up numbers, and they win. Will that game have any effect on the voters saying games played? You know, you have, I think, seven more games, Jokic versus Embiid. And also, how will they handle Embiid down the stretch? If you're up, you know, 25 points in the third quarter, do you rest him the rest of the way? So to me, JJ, I went when uh, Massachusetts legalized sports betting. I went to the Encore in Boston. I got uh, Jokic at minus 120. I'm feeling great about that. He went to like minus 300. Now I'm getting nervous. Now I'm starting to get a little bit more excited <laughs> thinking that Jokic could get it. So I'm all over the place, JJ. I think yeah. there's value on Jokic plus money, but you tell me who's going to get MVP here. Uh, you know, Josh, I wish I could tell you, and I did find out <laughs> recently that I do have a vote in all of this, which I'm very excited about. And I look at the season in, in its totality, and you bring up something that I think is key to this, and that is games played. And and so as of right now, Jokic has played 67. Uh, he's missed eight games. Joel has played 61. Uh, Giannis has played 59. And specifically on Giannis, here's what's interesting to me. I'll, I'll give you two points I want to make. Uh, there's been one player in NBA history who has missed 15 or more games and won MVP. That was Bill Walton in 1978. Giannis now at 16 games. But, but. Giannis's personal win percentage is just a few fraction of a, of a decimal point uh, under 75%. He's at 74.6 personal win percentage when he plays. And if you look back at the history of the NBA, he could become the sixth player to average 30 a game and have a personal win percentage of 75% or greater. And you go down the list. It's Harden in 2018. He won MVP. Steph Curry in 2016, he won MVP. Jordan in 96, Jordan in 92, won MVP. Kareem in 72, Kareem in 71, won MVP. Elgin Baylor in 62 did not win MVP. So in, in, in six of the seven times this has happened, historically, that player has won MVP. So I'm looking at games played down the stretch. I think this matters. Games played down the stretch. How much is Joel Embiid going to play? in these last stretch of games. I'm looking at Giannis's win percentage because I think you can make a strong argument that the real value here is in Giannis. If he plays in the Bucks' remaining games, given what he's done, again, he has a chance to become the fifth player ever to average 30, 10, and 5 in a season. They have been the best team. They've been even better with him on the floor. To me, there's, a, there's, a, there's an outside chance that he sneaks in there and wins this MVP. So I think today I don't have an answer for you. Today I don't. And that's why this remaining stretch of games to me is so important. And the reason I'm disappointed that MB did not play last night against Jokic is because I thought there were three moments down the stretch that could potentially sort of cement him as the favorite, as the guy for MVP. It was that game against Denver, They've got an upcoming game against Boston. They've got an upcoming game against Milwaukee. You still got two more chances. On the flip side of that, right, we've got Giannis and Boston squaring off later this week. We've got Giannis and Joel squaring off later on. So Giannis, to me, has a couple more chances to sort of swing voters' opinions about who the MVP is. But the games played portion, I think, is really important. 
Yeah, I'm right there with you, JJ. And again, how these teams handle these players down the stretch is critical because if you're the 76ers, are you more interested in getting Embiid as MVP or are you more interested in getting your guys healthy and ready to go for the playoffs? Obviously, with Doc Rivers and the organization, they're going to say, you know, we'd love Embiid to win it, but we're more interested in having a, a, a healthy roster here, especially Harden, who's been banged up. So it's really interesting that you highlight Giannis here because plus 475, that's a pretty good number. I think a lot of the betting market is really focused on this two-way race between Embiid and Jokic. But Giannis, to your point, I think as betters, it's always not just based on what you expect or hope or want to happen, but the price of the number. And at 475, again, he's missed some games here, but you gave us those great statistics that, hey, if he you know continues to play well down the stretch, 475 could have value, but JJ, I'm conflicted. I'm biased. I'm a big Jokic guy. I, I'm glad you admit you're biased. Not all of us, not all of us can do that. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the the thing for me that I I come back to with Jokic specifically is the defensive value, right? So we have these incredible on-off splits where he's uh, plus 13.4 on the court. He's minus 12. Uh, off the court and I should mention by the way of these three players that we're talking about Jokic's team is the only one that has a losing record with him off the court all right so that's incredibly valuable how much do voters value defense because Kirk uh, Goldsberry had an article the other day talking about uh, how how bad really some of his defensive numbers are you know for players that have uh, defended a high volume of shots at the rim. I think there's 33 guys that have met the criteria for this. He's dead last in opponent field goal percentage. So I, as as valuable as he is, and I'm not discrediting his value, the other two players are more valuable on the other end of the floor than Jokic. It doesn't mean he's not going to win MVP. It doesn't mean I'm not going to vote for him, right? It, it's You have to look at sort of the totality of everything and, and this is where I, I keep saying this. It's like, how blessed are we as NBA fans that we get to witness these three guys lead these teams, put up these historic numbers, and they're all, they're all deserving. They're all deserving. Um, the, the, the point about uh, Embiid that I think a lot of people have made, and I, I think in some ways this probably, and I want to get your opinion on this, this some, in some ways this does sway the betting market is the narrative aspect, right? The narrative about him being deserving because he hasn't won. And I'm curious if that affects the market at all. Cause there, there seemed to be this, this push for a couple weeks, this anti Jokic push. And last time we talked, it was before the straw poll came out for, and, and that <laughs> straw poll showed that Jokic was the heavy favorite and the odds then shifted to reflect that more and more with his, uh, you know, minus betting odds. Yeah, it's a great question, JJ. And you talk about like narrative too. Like another thing people are betting on right now is the NFL draft. So just from, I don't want to you know switch sports too much, but you can see a big fluctuation in the market based on Twitter and pro days and what people are saying based on different players. Like, Who's going to go one overall? C.J. Stroud, Bryce uh, Bryce Young. There's a big narrative here based on is Young too short? Is Stroud the guy? Because the connection here with Jim Reich and kind of that pro-style offense. So you'll see what I'm – based on the point I'm trying to make is you'll see a shift in the odds based upon how Twitter's reacting and how some different news is leaking out. And it's kind of the same thing here where – uh, you look at Embiid and it's like, hey, you know, the new some new blood here to win this award. Doesn't Embiid deserve it? Trust the process seems so long ago, but he really has. And he's been there and, you know, had injuries and really come a long way. This is kind of a culmination of his entire career, sticking with the Sixers, not demanding a trade, not going elsewhere, building it from the ground up and obviously putting up a career year. So deservedly so, I think a lot of voters will say, hey, this is Embiid's award. He's come close a couple times. Now it's his time to win it. But then to your point, JJ, the straw poll, which was, again, it's kind of tough to go off of, you know, a month ago, two months ago, things have changed, odds have changed. But that told you that there wasn't much of a bias against Jokic. He, I think he got 77% of yeah. the first place vote. So even though he's won it two years in a row, I think the voters and, and JJ, you're going to have to deal with this. Good luck with this. It's like, you know, uh, can I put my bias aside? Can I really look at what the the kind of the, the tenets of the award are and not let the past influence my opinion, but just this year on the court, who's been the best player? So I think if you get into a situation of who deserves it more, you know, who's waited long enough, uh, to me, that's when I think as a voter, maybe you're getting in a little bit of hot water. I think if you stick with just the players on the court who have been the best this year, I think Jokic, uh, despite winning two in a row, 
Uh, and again, I, I wonder if you look at this too, JJ, a lot of the ESPN Hollinger advanced analytics, he has a, 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 a stat here called player efficiency. And Jokic is your best player efficiency, 32.02, and Bede's right behind him here. So as we get you know, uh, you know, know, more and more into analytics and we advance into how stats are so heavily based in all sports, do voters just lean on the analytics and say, give me a number that tells me who the best player is, and that will influence my opinion. So a lot to to, to kind of uh, you know di- dive into here. And it's going to be fascinating, too, because I know a lot of people who love Embiid MVP, a lot of people who love Jokic. You gave us some good value here with with Giannis. It's going to be fascinating to see how these voters uh, decide who the MVP is. Yeah, a few things on that point. First of all, uh, you you said hot water. I just want to be clear with with everybody. Like, (laughs) this is not something I will be betting on. I I maintain my integrity here. I'm going to vote the way I think I will vote. And there's no betting action involved on my part. Um with MB, the, the one thing I should note that there was some some narrative stuff that happened with Jokic, and then simultaneously the Nuggets lost four in a row. Embiid made this push where he had ten straight games of thirty or more, shot over fifty percent from the field, which had only been done once in the modern era. I think Shaq was the only other player to do it. So, like Embiid is deserving. I mean, I don't think it was just this anti uh, Jokic push. And you bring up analytics, and this is where I think, as voters, we are very lucky in 2023 that we have a wealth of information. We're more informed than we could ever be when deciding on things like uh, MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, All NBA, all this stuff. Right? We can factor in all this stuff, but you also have to look at team record. You also have to look at individual record. You also have to look at games played. So. While I do lean on analytics a lot besides the eye test, I also think very basic counting stats of games played, uh, you know, a, a great stat that has a strong correlation with MVP is win shares per 48, right? And so if if a, if a player is is being managed, let's say, down the stretch, then that, ne- that shouldn't necessarily affect his MVP status or MVP candidacy. Um, we should look at, you know, the, what he's doing, the output of what he's doing in these games leading up to the playoffs. And I bring up uh, Defensive Player of the Year, and I want to see sort of where we're at with that because it feels like there's really just two guys in the conversation for this award. You're exactly right, JJ. So spoiler alert, it looks like it's either going to be Jaron Jackson Jr. or Brooke Lopez. Currently, we do have uh, Lopez as the favorite right now. He's minus 185. Jackson's plus 140. We've seen a big push toward Lopez here over the last month or so. I remember last time you and I did a pod, I think Jackson was the favorite. And this also goes to show you how difficult it is to bet on these markets because on the one hand, you want to get a good number. On the other hand, if you bet it too early, things change. Injuries happen, you know, team records change. So it's really difficult as a better to kind of get the right player and the right number here. And just for example, JJ, like we we're bringing up MVP, we're bringing up defensive player of the year, because to me, these awards still have a little bit of value. Like rookie of the year, Paolo Bancaro is minus 6,000. I mean, he's going to get it. There's no value to bet that number. I want to give you some credit too, JJ, because you and I talked last time about most improved player of the year. I was looking towards Shea Gilgis Alexander and you kept telling me Markinen was the guy. Well, to your credit, JJ, Markinen is now minus 380. So mm. to me, when you're betting that? these numbers, yeah, so uh, give, give JJ some props there on that one. Nice nice job, my man. Uh, but to me, it's like if you're above minus 200 or more, I really am not going to bet on you. I just think these numbers are getting out of hand. So why I wanted to bring up the defensive player of the year is that at minus 185, it's kind of an expensive number, but it's not that bad. It's not a minus 400, minus uh, 6,000. You don't have to risk a ton. You can still make a little bit of money here. It's tough for me, though, JJ, to quantify a defensive player of the year. Like there is a metric defensive win shares. Uh, we're actually Garland, I believe, is number one. Uh, he's not really in the conversation here, but you do have Lopez two and Jackson three. So what I'm getting at is, is there any value in your opinion, JJ, for Jackson Jr. at plus 140? It's a decent number. Do we see this thing creep up further to Lopez? And to you, what quant- quantifies a good defensive player? Is it just good one-on-one defense? Is it an anchor down in the middle? And then also, JJ, I'm wondering who was the, the most difficult matchup you ever had in the NBA, who was the best defensive player that you played against? Oh, wow. Although there's a, probably a lot of good ones. Um, I, I like Tony Allen guarded me a lot. Uh, Marcus Smart, another Celtic, guarded me a lot. Those two guys were really tough. Um, we did a, uh, had a seven game series in 2015 against the Spurs, and Kawhi guarded me for a lot of that series. He didn't guard me a lot overall in my career, but when he did, yeah, he was, he was probably the toughest. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> 
So look, I this is this is an interesting one to me. Uh, both these teams have fluctuated for the better part of the season in the top three overall in terms of team defensive rating. I think that matters, right? I, I when we talk about defensive player, that you cannot be defensive player of the year if your team is thirteenth overall in defense. Because while individual defense does matter, you said the word there. You have to be an anchor of a great defense for me to consider you as a defensive player of the year. Both these guys are. So they they qualify in that respect. I go back a little bit with this. Games played. I, 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 look, Jared Jackson Jr. was hurt to start the season, coming off off-season knee surgery. And that's not, a, that's not a fault of his. But the reality is, as of today, Brooke Lopez has played 73 games. Jaron Jackson Jr. has played 57 games, okay? So, and and look, I, I don't know which reference you were using for the def- defensive win shares, but I believe on basketball reference, uh, they had Evan Mobley, Jason Tatum, Vucevic, uh, Jared Allen, and then Lopez. That was the top five. Jaron Jackson Jr., obviously, because of those games played, was all the way back at 11th. Um, but the other, the other things I'm looking at, like let's do counting stats, right? Stocks, blocks and steals. Jackson Jr., 4.4 blocks and steals, leads the league in blocks. Lopez, second in the league in blocks. He's at 3.0 stocks, right? So I think that disruption matters, right? Rim protection, I think that matters. Marcus Smart last year is a great example of disruption, right? His ability to be a pest, his ability to draw charges, offensive fouls, off the ball, uh, deflections, all that's it. That's what I mean by disruption. You're disrupting the flow of an offense. Marcus was great with that. And the team was, of course, a top defense in the league last season. Uh, I mentioned the team defensive numbers. Both these teams have fluctuated, you know, in the top three, one, two, three, all season, uh, along with Cleveland. Jaron Jackson Jr., in his minutes, the Grizzlies have a 105.8 defensive rating. Lopez in his minutes, the Bucks have a 106.7 defensive rating. That's just too close to call. That's such a minuscule difference. Jared Jackson Jr. obviously has a lead in stocks. And then Brooke Lopez has the lead in games played. So all these things we talked about are factored in. I personally don't have a favorite between these two. The one thing I will say, Brooke Lopez has the benefit, and this is not a knock on his defense. He has the benefit of playing alongside Giannis, who has won Defensive Player of the Year, is arguably the best two-way player in all of basketball. And so he has that. So I think in some ways, whether you like it or not, you have to give Jaron Jackson Jr. credit for the team impact that he's had on Memphis. And obviously, Dylan Brooks is a fantastic defender. Tyus Jones, his advanced metrics defensively are great. They have good defenders on that team. But I, you're talking about one of the all-time defensive players that Brooke Lopez is playing alongside. And so I think that factors in a little bit in this conversation. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point, JJ. Your point on Marcus Smart to me I think was really fascinating because last year what made Smart such a great uh, play to win that sixth man of the year or, uh, sorry, defensive player of the year was that he was the best defensive player on the best defensive team. I think that really kind of makes it quite easy for a lot of voters to just say, hey, who is the best defensive team? Udoka, Celtics, boom. Who was their anchor? It was Marcus Smart. This one's a little bit more difficult because, again, games played, you have uh, Lopez checking off that box. But again, it's like, you know, Tim Duncan and David Robinson. Like, it's nice to have one guy next to you if you're playing defense. Same thing here with, you know, Brooke Lopez being able to lean on Giannis. So betting markets saying Lopez here, again, you can get Jackson Jr. at a pretty decent number. To me, over these next 10 days, JJ, it's where do these numbers move? Do you start to see uh, Lopez creep up to minus 200? Do you start to see these things tighten? And then, of course, MVP, we have a couple guys at plus mon- uh, plus money numbers. Do they flip to a minus number? So again, fascinating to watch here. I want to add one thing to your point because you, you brought sure. up the the Marcus Smart best defensive like best player best defensive team. Like I think we reached an inflection point when Marcus All won Defensive Player of the Year. That was the <laughs> the first time in my memory, at least, where voters really factored in the defensive rating of the team, the defensive rating of Marcus All when he's on the floor. It wasn't as much about the counting stats. And I think when we talk about all defensive team, first and second team, more and more voters are looking at those numbers versus just blocks and steals, which are, truthfully, steals to me are are one of the most uh, random stats because a lot of it is, not a lot of it, some of it is gambling, right? Some of it is gambling. Some guys that 
have a lot of steals also have a lot of fouls right you're putting your team you're actually doing a detriment to your team by fouling a lot trying to get steals and then the other team is getting in the bonus earlier and shooting more free throws and that affects your de- defensive rating so like i i really always look back at that mark gasol uh, defensive player of the year vote as being an inflection point for analytics when we talk about all these different awards yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too because you know, number one, I learned what what did you say? A, a stock, a stock, a block, and a steal. I've never heard that term before, JJ. So you're, yeah. you're introducing me to new terms. This is great. Uh, but the other thing with analytics is like, you know, are you looking and studying the right analytics? Like I gave to you some analytics that I thought defensive player of the year showed me it was, you know, Garland one, and then these two guys here, you know, t- you know, two and five or whatever was mentioned. You told me another one that was different. So I think as betters make sure just a cautionary tale that you are identifying the right statistics. Like I was going off of NBA.com. Maybe I was looking at the wrong header or the way that it's handled. These advanced analytics are so in depth and so finite that, you know, you might be seeing some like uh, Holy grail number here. That's like, Oh, this guy's way better in this statistical category, like war in baseball or, you know, Pakoda. These are all these different names that you see across different sports. I would just say, Make sure if you're saying like, oh, like I like Lopez because this number's better. Well, what exactly is that stat? And make sure it's a you know a real stat that uh, maybe isn't uh, too wonky or too complex to understand. So again, just make sure there's so many advanced analytics out there. Make sure you actually know which ones that you're leaning on. Yeah, and it just you know to explain win shares in the most basic terms because I'm not a mathematician. Uh, in general, if a team has 48 win shares, let's say. Um, if you add up the win shares for each individual player, it will be plus or minus a very small percentage of 48. It'll end up being 48.17 or 47.9, whatever it is. So it's based on the total wins that the team has at the time. And it's the same thing for advanced or uh, offensive and defensive, right? There's only a certain amount of offensive win shares that are available of that 48. And there's only a certain amount of defensive win shares that are available of that 48. And that's how they come to that. And again, it's a lot of it is based on box score. It's based on plus minus. It's based on the, the stuff we're talking about, deflections, steals, blocks, whatever. Rebounds, defensive rebound is a, is a huge indicator for, for defensive win shares. That's why it was never good in that category. Um, but, but, but all those things sort of factor into this. Josh, always awesome. Appreciate the time, my man. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, JJ. Have a great all day. Right. Thank you. Thanks for watching another episode of Islands in the League presented by DraftKings, our exclusive YouTube video series. We'll be back very soon with episode four. Now, here's a disclaimer to the viewer. No, I'm not saying Andre Iguodala or John Paxson are butlers. I'm saying role players are important.